Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by FunkinStuff.net, this is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin' Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am honored to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Robin Russell drummer and composer for the seminal Detroit-based soul funk collective consisting of the Nightlighters and New Birth. He played with both beloved acts as the former became the instrumental foundation for the latter's vocalists, and they combined to release more than a dozen classic albums during the 1970s. Nine of them entered the R&B Top 40, and from those albums, the group charted 10 Top 30 R&B singles. Those hits included It's Impossible, KG, I Can Stand It, It's Been a Long Time, Wildflower, and Dream Merchant. At the same time, the ensemble became famous for its powerful live performances. Robin, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm good, and you? I'm well, thank you. So glad to have you on the show. Where are you coming to us from? I'm in Los Angeles right now. Not a bad place to be this time of year, I would say. <laughs> oh, it's, it's beautiful. Today is 80 degrees. It's like summer. <laughs> wow. Um, where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. I'm, I'm a native. Oh, well, you're talking to a fellow native, too, although now I'm on the East Coast. But uh, um, you can't see me at the moment, but I have, I'm representing with my Lakers hat. So, Right. Yeah. Um, well, hey, been excited to get you on the show. Uh, you know, the music that you've uh, been part of has come up many, many times. And so uh, anxious to uh, hear the inside scoop on how some of that was uh, laid down. So thanks again for joining the show. Okay, my pleasure, my honor. So from Los Angeles, uh, Robin, what led you to a life in music and why the drums specifically? Well, the music, um, actually, I grew up, you know, in, in, in my household, my parents, neither one played an instrument, but they loved music. So when I was in elementary school, I mean, I would come home from school, my mother would be listening to Cannonball Adderley or 
uh, Jimmy Smith, uh, Miles Davis. So I grew up in uh, a musical atmosphere. Uh, and once I entered um, junior high school, uh, my parents both, they loved the saxophone. So they, they said, you know, would you like to take up sax? And I did. I started playing the tenor sax. And I played it uh, through junior high, through high school. I played in the school band and orchestra. But in my senior year of high school, drums just sort of overwhelmed me. Uh, and one reason, when I was playing the horn, when we were in the school band and orchestra, I, I was okay. But I started playing in these little groups with uh, my friends, and I had to stand at the front of the stage. And I was really kind of shy, and I, <laughs> I never really liked that. You know, and, and one day at rehearsal, uh, you know, some friends of mine, I just sat down behind the drums. And the, the coordination uh, between my four limbs was there. I could just play a simple beat, nothing fancy, but all four limbs were in sync. And, you know, this light went off in my head. And it said, if you play this instrument, you won't have to stand at the front of the stage. So that's what did it. Um, and I, I came home and I told my father, you know, it's like, Pop, Pop, you know, I want to play drums. I want to play drums. And he said, well, I bought you your saxophone. If you really want to play drums, get you a part-time job and buy you some drums. So I was in, in my senior high school year, and I got this part-time job working at the big library downtown. And I, I had my first set of drums before I graduated high school. And from there, I just would practice and practice and practice. Uh, and you know, one thing led to another, but that's how it all began. I'm, I'm a converted tenor saxophonist. Oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. I haven't heard too many uh, stories about switching from the saxophone to the drums. Yeah, it, it, it was a smooth transition. Uh, and I, I just felt so relieved because I didn't have to stand at the front of that stage anymore. <laughs> that was that was a big plus. Although you had a lot more gear to have to worry about lugging around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's sometimes I think about that, but you know, if you love drums, you don't mind doing it. It's like cuz once everything is set up, it's like you're in heaven. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm I'm pretty sure just about any drummer would tell you that. But I mean, we get to a point where uh, we're in a situation where we have roadies, uh, and we don't have to touch it until we sit down. But in the beginning, it's 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 a second thought. You just it's like, how are you going to play without moving the stuff? Uh, so. You know, it, it's, it's just, it comes with the turf. Did you have some uh, drummer influences early on that you kind of aspired to or that you found inspiring? Oh, absolutely. And it was a variety because of the music I used to hear at home. You know, I, I had my, my big band drummers like Louis Belson and Buddy Rich. I had my my straight ahead jazz drummers like uh, Art Blakey, Elvin Jones. Uh, I had my my fusion drummers like Tony Williams, Billy Cobham, uh, 
Lenny White, you know, and I had my my funk drummers, uh, you know, the, the drummers that were with James Brown uh, and Greg from Sly and the Family Stone. He was like super funky. So, and I had my rock drummers like uh, Ginger Baker, uh, Mitch Mitchell with Jimi Hendrix, uh, Buddy Miles, uh, John Bonham from uh, Led Zeppelin. So I had a, you know, a combination and I would listen to all of them. Uh, so it, it, it was a lot, you know, your, what comes in your ears is education. So when I wasn't playing, I was listening to somebody. It, it might be funk, it might be rock, it might be jazz, it might be blues, but it was a combination. And uh, I just, I still like that. You know, I like to play all those different styles. Um, you, you, you don't get bored. Yeah, you just rattled off about uh, a dozen or more all-time greats right there. Uh, very impressive list. What um, was the extent of your professional experience, would you say, before you connected for the Night Lighters? Before the Night Lighters and New Birth, um, my first, you know, real professional gigs, the guy that I consider my musical godfather, Johnny Guitar Watson. Um, I played with him when I was in my, I, actually I played with him twice in his career. But the, that first time around, I was in my initial learning curve, but I was, I was good enough to play with him. And he would tease me. He would say, you know, you, you play like you've been on this earth for 50 years, but you're still wet behind the ears. <laughs> Uh, and while I was playing with him, I, I studied drums at, uh, Los Angeles city college. And he noticed a difference because a lot of things I was playing, I didn't know what I was playing. Uh, but once I went to LACC and got tuned into the, the rudiments and all, and it just got better and better. Uh, and even in school, I had chops. Um, at the end of each week, we would have um, we would have a test. You know, we might okay this week it might be root. I mean, um, paradiddles or whatever. I would actually get standing ovations from the class. You know, you had to take your test in front of the class. So. From Johnny Guitar Watson, I met Little Richard, and it was actually on one of the gigs with Mr. Watson. He and Richard were good friends, and uh, I, we were we were playing. I think we were on our second set, and then I saw this figure come into the club, and I said, "My God, that's Little Richard," and. He came into the dressing room on our break. You know, of course, he and Johnny were good friends. I had never met him before. And he looked at me. He said, you know, I'm Little Richard. And I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I know. I'm like, my God. <laughs> and then he just straight out. He just said, I want you to be my drummer. And, you know, my jaw just dropped to the floor. I'm like, that's Little Richard. No, he, he's, he's pulling my leg. And he said, give me your phone number and I'm going to call you uh, in the morning because I'm, I'm going on the, on the road. We're going to do a world tour uh, in about three weeks. And I'm, I'm like, oh, sure. Little Richard's going to call me uh, in the morning. Well, the next morning the phone rang and it was him. And I'm like, oh, my God, my, my jaw dropped to the floor again <laughs> and 
he, he once again told me I'm going on the road. He also wanted Mr. Watson to go. At first, you know, Johnny said he was going to do it. So Richard said, um, I need you to meet my, my musical director, uh, Mr. Bumps Blackwell, the, the famous Bumps Blackwell. So he said, can you meet with him today? And I said, yeah. So, you know, he, you know, we set a time that day and he said, I'll, I'll send somebody to pick you up. So there I am, 19 years old. And uh, we set a time, the doorbell rang. And the guy says, uh, you know, is Robin Russell here? And I said, yeah, I'm Robin. He said, okay. Little Richard sent for you. I said, I'll, I'll be right out. So I, I come running out the house, and there's this big old black limousine. Nobody in there. And I'm like, my jaw dropped to the floor again. <laughs> so we went. Uh, Richard was staying at a hotel out in Hollywood. And when I got there, Richard was there, Bumps was there, and, you know, Bumps kind of went over, uh, you know, how Richard likes the show. And he told me, he said, Richard really likes your drumming because of your energy. He says he likes, you know, that up-tempo, fiery stuff. And he said, that's what Richard told me. He said, I met this, this young drummer that has the fire that I like. So that just blew my mind. You know, it's like, oh my God. And sure enough, in about three weeks, uh, we left for the tour. We did a, a warm up gig at the, the Wilton Theater here in Los Angeles. The second gig was at Madison Square Garden in New York. The third gig was at Wembley Stadium in London. It, it was the rock of the London Rock and Roll Show, and on that show was Chuck Berry, um, Bo Diddley, Bill Haley and the Comets, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, and Richard, and that was just mind blowing. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I kept pinching myself. You know, I was still 19 and I, I just couldn't believe it. And so we, you know, we finished the tour in Europe. Um, we went to Spain, Germany, Rome. And on our way back, Richard gathered the band on the plane. And he says, I have a calling from God. And he says, when we get back to Los Angeles, I'm going back into religion. So you guys will be on your own. So we, you know, we said, okay, you know. Um, and after that, I hooked up with two of my friends that I was playing with off and on. We had this power trio called Magic Mushroom and we played Jimi Hendrix music, Cream and the rest of the music was our originals and we were we were pretty pretty impressive. People like we played at the, the Watts Festival and you know here's these three young black guys playing this acid rock you know, in the middle of Watts. And people loved it. They were like, loved it. And when I came off the stage, this drummer, his name was Matthew, from this group called Ebony Rhythm Funk Campaign. They were from Indianapolis. And he, he was just, he said, man, when you guys fired it up, we were way on the other side of the park, and we came running over here. So Matthew and I started hanging out and he was, he was real good. And one day he told me, he said, some friends of mine are looking for a drummer. And I said, really, who? And he said, 
the night lighters, and the new birth. I had never heard of new birth, but I had heard of the night lighters. And I said, Matthew, the night lighters? I said, those, those guys are like the equivalent of Chicago. That's like, that's how impressed I was with them. I said, Matthew, I don't think I'm good enough to play with them. And he looked at me and he said, are you crazy? <laughs> and so they were having an audition. He said, man, go up to that house and audition. So I did. And what happened, uh, the band leader, James Baker, he played trombone. He, he really plays a little bit of everything. Uh, they let Baker play one set. And they said, he's, he's going to play it, and then we want you to play it. So I sat down, and somehow I played that whole set without a mistake. And the last song had this kind of tricky ending. It was you know, these accents were like, boom, pop, pop, boom, 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 pop, pop. And I caught it. And when I finished, they all looked at me, and Baker says, the gig is yours if you want it. And that was like in September of, of 72. And Baker told me, we're going to cut a Nightlighter album and a New Birth album in December. And he said, if you stick with us, uh, you, you'll be a part of it. So I got to play on the last Nightlighter album, Analysis. And then I played on the New Birth album. My first album with New Birth was Birthday, which I can understand it became a big hit. And from there, everything just went straight up, you know, because uh, when I started with them, we worked our way back east uh, to, to do that record, those recordings. We were working nightclubs. And after I can understand it, you know, hit the charts, then we were doing concerts. We were opening up, you know, for, for major acts. And the next album, it's been such a long time, also was a hit. Uh, the title track, been such a long time, big hit. And before we knew it, we were, not the opening act, we were the headliners. Uh, and it, it just went from better to better to better to better. And during that period, uh, and even during the period with Little Richard, it's like so many of my dreams came true. You know, I used to dream of, first of all, playing big concerts. When I was back home, uh, that's when, when I was playing with, with Mr. Watson and even before, I would sit in my garage and I, I could see myself playing at big arenas. I would just close my eyes and imagine. Was, was part of my practice um, regiment, I would put on a record and put on some headphones and play along with it. And uh, I would imagine, I would just close my eyes and I could see myself playing in big auditoriums. I couldn't tell you which one it was, but I could see myself in these big auditoriums. So that dream came true. Uh, I, I, I would dream of driving down the street in my car turning on the radio and hearing myself. That dream came true. I, I, I would dream of walking into a record shop and picking up an album and seeing me on the cover. That came true. Uh, I would dream of turning on the television and seeing myself playing with somebody. That dream came true. Uh, and I had I had this dream of hearing myself on a record with, with a string section behind me. Uh, and 
that dream came true. So just a side note, dream, please, your dreams can come true. Uh, it's a good thing to dream if you're dreaming in a positive way because it, it just sets you up for those dreams to come true. It's like, wow, you saw something, you believed it, you believed in it, you believed in yourself, and you made it happen. <laughs> so I believe in the power of dreaming. And, you know, new birth, you know, from that point, we just, we became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, it was, you know, at one point we were just such a tight knit family. Uh, just, we were just so close as a unit. And that's what, that's part of the, of the chemistry of what made us so good because we, you know, we were just like a tight knit family and we, we just used to have so much fun. Uh, Robin, you covered so much, you covered so much ground there. I'm going to cut you off and jump in to try to uh, dig a little deeper on some of that. Cause man, what an amazing story. And uh, just so much credit to you for, for accomplishing that. Um, the Johnny Guitar Watson, do you know Emery Thomas? Oh, yeah. He's been DT on the show. I, we're very good friends. Yeah. Very good friends. Yeah, he's, because, he's a character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw him not not long ago. Um, he, um, yeah, when, when I left to go with Richard, because Johnny told me that he, he decided to stay, uh, he wanted to work on his music, but he gave me his blessing. He said, you go ahead and do this gig. It will be good for you. So with New Birth, I'm glad you uh, gave those details so that history is clear because, um, you know, I wasn't even clear which was your first record with them. So thank you for that. Um, okay. But just so that uh, viewers and listeners know a little bit more of the history of the Nightlighters and New Birth, because I don't think that they get enough exposure today, you know, and, um, you know, the Nightlighters was just a crackerjack, uh, big band kind of soul review uh, group that, uh, you know, I tell people it's kind of like the way the JBs were, the way early Cool and the Gang was, um, but really powerful, great horns. And then um, the vocalists came in on the new birth side, right? So at, at one point, it was what, like 17 people in the group? Yes, that was before I joined the group. Uh, yeah, there, there were 17 because it was the Nightlighters, New Birth, Love, Peace, and Happiness, and the Mint Juleps, I believe. Uh, but by the time I got with them, it was just the Nightlighters and the New Birth, and it was 12 people. 12, yeah. And um, what were, uh, you know, some of the talents or personalities like? in that group when you got there? Who impressed you and why? Um, you know, we we actually all were, were equal. You know, it's everybody had their own way of expressing themselves. Uh, you know, we, we would just come up with the funniest things, but one there was really a he could he could be a stand-up comedian alan fry who was the, the vocalist he was the one with the high falsetto voice he was the funniest person oh god he would just have us cracking up you know he he had these these uh voices these imaginary characters that he came up with and it was so funny. He would just have us on the floor cramping. 
you know, his characters. He he could easily have uh, been a comedian. I could see him on on Saturday Night Live or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he was he was a character. But you know, everybody had their own way of um, expressing themselves, and you know, we we just used to keep keep each other going. Uh, so it was, you know, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Well, when you came in, they started doing more originals. You know, they had done so many cover tunes. And so um, what was the creative process of the group like? I mean, how did you come up with compositions and how did you, uh, what was it like in the studio? Well, actually, some of the tunes we came up with on the spot, right in the studio. Um, there were other songs where one individual had come up with this 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 riff or these lyrics, um, and then they would bring it to the group and. Everybody would, you know, add in their parts. Sometimes whoever came up with their their song, they may have had an idea. Okay, I, I want you to play this. I hear this. I hear that. Uh, and others, a song might be brought uh, just a part of the song, you know, the, the, the main part of the song, and we would add what we felt. It's like this is this is what I hear, this is what I feel, um, and there were um, some of the tunes that some of them we they had the ideas before we got in the studio, but we had never really played the tune, and there are others that we had played, uh, you know, out on the road. Uh, and one example, I can understand it. That song, uh, we had been playing out on the road. So when we recorded it, it was so tight. You know, I can't remember exactly, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the first take because we had, we knew it like in and out and we had played it many times and it was, um, you know, it, it was just tight from the beginning. Uh, but, you know, in, in the studio, you never know uh, what you're playing, if, what impact it might have on other musicians, other vocalists, other groups. So when, when you're in, in there recording, I mean, you just, you give it your best. You feel it, you know, what you're feeling. Um, and, you know, it's the reward, you know, when you come up with something and then the, the album comes out and the song becomes a hit. And it's, it's like, wow, you know, <laughs> you know, when we recorded this, you know, you, you always hope that your song would become a hit, but sometimes it can be a song that you didn't think was going to be a hit. It might be, oh, we need another tune to fill up this album. We'll just come up with something, and your next thing, the next thing you know, that song becomes a hit. Uh, so, you know, it's it's just uh, I I just think it's a, a well-rounded process. The, the group, Robin, was on such fire uh, in that 72, 74 uh, area when you came in. And Analysis, I mean, is an all-time funk classic album. I'm not sure how well it did upon its release, but I think uh, in hindsight at least, I mean, it's well revered. And um, you had some key compositions on there, uh, Serenade for a Jive Turkey and uh, Dramology. 
Uh, what do you remember about making that record in particular? And it's also got some pretty cool artwork too. Yeah, you know, Serenade for Jive Turkey. Uh, Jive Turkey is my middle, I mean, my my name that the group gave me. It's, uh, it's a whole nother story. So I came up with that composition. Actually, the, the drum, the drum beat, Actually, that's something I heard from Carlos Santana. And I just added to it. Uh, and, it, you know, I wanted to mix it up, you know, because the night lighters to me were just amazing. You know, the horns and all. So I wanted to, you know, put that that kind of Afro Latin beat, and then it's, I said, let's mix some jazz in there with it, and and some, you know, some nice breaks and accents, uh, and it it turned out to be real good. Uh, you know, I'm I'm very happy with that song, uh, very happy. And drumology was actually the idea of um, our producer at that time. He was our manager producer, Harvey Fuqua. Uh, he wanted to hear a tune that featured myself uh, with the bass under me, Leroy Taylor. So we, um, that was, the goal. Uh, so he just said, you guys go in there and rip it up. And that's what we did. Uh, and that, that album, you know, being the, the last Nightlighter album, it, it had a little different twist than the earlier Nightlighter albums. Um, there was just, the sound was just different. I guess, you know, it's a, a a new drummer, so it's it's going to sound different. But it was good. Some of those tracks on there are really, I mean, it's like, it's, it's classic Nightlighters. Uh, and it, it, it was, that was my first professional uh, recording session. Uh, analysis, the Nightlighters album, and Birthday. I knew her. Uh, wow, that's quite an auspicious uh, start to studio work, I would say. Um, yeah. Well, why, why do you think that was the last record under the Nightlighters name? Well, we were signed with RCA at that time. And once um, I Can Understand It became a hit, our, our contract with RCA was about to expire. So we were, we were going to sign a new contract and they said, we would like you guys to just concentrate on new birth and drop the nightlighters, just do new birth. Uh, that was their suggestion. And you know, we followed their suggestion, uh, and you know when it first happened, you know I, I was little. I didn't quite know how to take it because it's like God, the night lighters, no, no more. Um, but you know, new birth took off, and we got so big. It's not that we forgot about the night lighters, but. We were just, I mean, we were signed with RCA, all of us, as new birth. Uh, and so that's that's why Analysis was the last Nightlighter album. Uh, we could have independently done some, some Nightlighter material, but it's like, why? You know, we, we're working this new birth machine, and it's... it's working good so 
Yeah, well, it definitely it's ended on an up note, you know, with that being mm -hmm. the last night lighters. Um, and birthday for New Birth, I mean, it was such a huge uh, shift in their sound with that record. I mean, much funkier and just deeper, in my opinion. Um, and uh, being a funk guy, you know, I really like uh, Got to Get a Nut. That's a highlight uh, for me on there. <laughs> oh, God. That song, uh, to this day, I, I get compliments uh, on, on what I did with that song. And when I cut it, when we cut it, I had no idea that it would have any kind of impact on drummers. I, I mean, I've run into drummers that told me that song was one of the biggest challenges you know, to to play, to learn, uh, and it. I can't think of anybody else, any other song at that time, where a drummer did what I did. But the song really called, in my opinion, for what I was doing because we had a lot of changes in it. Uh, you know, a lot of horn accents. And, you know, I would play an accent leading into the horn accent, hit the accent with the horns, and then I would play an accent leading away from the accent. Uh, and it, the song was just, it was made uh, just, you know, it was, I, I don't know, it was just made for a variety, it, the, you know, the door was open, and still to this day, I mean, some of the greatest drummers in the world talk about that song, uh, and it's like, I had no idea, I just did my thing. <laughs> wow, and that album actually went to number one on the R&B chart. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was really a, a good album, really. Um, and, you know, it, it, it like broke the ice. From there, things just skyrocketed. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was just, it was so good and such a blessing to, to, you know, to experience that, uh, and you know, I'm 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 just I'm proud to have you know been a part of that. Uh, you know what a blessing. Who who are some of the uh, acts you went out on tour with uh, once that took off like that? Some of the acts we were with um, Parliament Funkadelic. Before they came, became real big, they actually used to open up for us. Uh, and they were some of my best friends. Uh, the original Funkadelic drummer, Tiki Forward, he and I were so close. We were, we were the best, best of friends. Another group who are good friends, the Ohio Players, uh, Diamond the drummer with the Ohio players. Her and I were just like Tiki, you know, the best of friends. And we still are. Uh, some of the other groups we, we toured with, Bootsy Collins, uh, Rolls Royce, uh, uh, goodness, Mandrill. Uh, but I remember one of the toughest gigs we did it was Rolls Royce, Bootsy Collins, and and New Birth, and we were the top billing. Rolls Royce opened, and Bootsy came on. We knew on that show we're gonna, we're gonna have to drop bombs. I mean, to come behind those two groups, and we did it. We did it. We tore the audience up, you know, because they were all warmed up coming behind those two groups. Uh, but some of the groups that we used to 
open up for were like Gladys Knight, Gladys and the Pips, um, the Four Tops. Um, you know, I I can't think of too many more. But there were many more, but you know, the memory banks are kind of going. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we 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 travel and toured with you know some of the top uh, R&B groups around. Uh, you know, Cool in the Gang. You know, if, the longer I think, the more will will come up. Yeah. Uh, we well, named some of the seminal ones for sure. Um, who was there? Any one of them? I mean, you mentioned how you had to really bring it coming behind Rose Royce and Bootsy, uh, but was there anyone else that just really stood out to you that they just lit the stage on fire? Um. Well, you know, Funkadelic. They they were Parliament Funkadelic. I mean, before they got big. They would, they would light the place on fire, uh, and and to have to come behind them, you you had to have a bigger torch because when they got through with an audience, they were you know, it's like, boy, they worked them over real good. Uh, but we loved uh, being on the shows with them. Uh, you know, because it, it would make us play better. You know, so you had to. Otherwise, you might lose your audience. So we would just turn the heat up. Uh, and, you know, it, it was, it, it was no, no, no jealousy or none of that. We were, we were friends. We were friends. It's like you go out there and tear it up. And we're gonna go out there and tear it up. Uh, so it, it was real good. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.